Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed the day, and I, uh, in particular, enjoyed the discussion we've had after, uh, before this session, and uh, these last two presentations, which uh, I found extremely relevant for my own work and the work that I'll, that I'll present to you today. Um, the uh, so this one. Um, let me immediately acknowledge that all the work I described today um, was done in collaboration with Matthew Stevens, who is a statistician at the University of Chicago. Um, and what I'll talk today, uh, I'll, I'll be a little bit of a, my six-year-old always says that I'm a party pooper. So I'll do that a little bit. I'll, I'll talk about challenges that I think um, we haven't completely uh, resolved. Um, we talked all day about the different biological and technical factors that uh, contribute to variation in, in single cell data. And we are extremely excited about single cell data because immediately and intuitively it allows us to look at different uh, aspects of the data, ask questions or answer questions that we've been asking for, for decades, uh, and look at the problems from different perspective. It really is the, the telescope that for the first time allows us to actually look at the stars. And so. Um, I don't think that anything we say in these early days is wrong, um, but I think that we'll have to have a lot more development before we can really go deep and utilize this technology the way we all hope that it will be utilized. And the first challenge I'll describe, I actually think it can be solved uh, fairly easily for a large, in a large number of contexts, but it is pretty difficult in some large, in some contexts, and it is the uh, issue of batch effects. And, and re recall how Barbara said a couple of times in her talk uh, that as long as the batch effect is not correlated with another source of variation, that's, that's fine. And in the previous talk before Barbara, uh, Raul particularly pointed out or, 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 or focused on the problem of cell type because it's easy to think about batch effect and cell type. They're rarely in the designs that are commonly used are, are correlated. But in fact, most of the other speakers and most of the challenges that we would like to face in the, uh, in the clinic and in the medically uh, oriented perspective are the variation between individuals. And we heard a lot of the speaker talk about this. Uh, why is, uh, Romney said at the beginning, why, is, uh, why are some individuals susceptible and some are not? Why some respond and some are not? How is the genotype affected? And, more than anything, what happens when the genotype is the same and I still have different response? It's really the difference between individuals that drive a lot of these questions. Of course, not entirely, not only, but, but certainly a lot of it. And the biggest problem currently is that practically all, nearly all of the data sets that are collected are collected with this particular uh, general study design where each individual is processed for single cell characterization of the data, whether it's gene expression, ataxic, or, or any other epigenetic modification, using a single batch. And this means immediately that the batch and the individual genotype are entirely correlated. So how big of a deal is it? Um, we wanted to tackle this head on by, by performing a study that will immediately allow us to uh, look at batch separately and independently from individual, and the design is intuitive. You simply uh, replicate the individual. I'm showing you uh, the data from a C1. We've, we've done similar work now on, with other platforms. Importantly, in order to be able to also analyze this data uh, in a way that is more standard, pretending that this uh, that batch effect Im impact has, we added ERCC, which are the spiking controls. These are the typical controls that people are using to uh, normalize most of the single cell data. Those are the controls that usually are ignored by people like Barbara and Raul that are doing something more sophisticated that is very effective when batch and, and, and another source of variation are not correlated. And we also added UMIs, and I'll talk briefly about UMIs because uh, those are the unique molecular identifiers that are becoming more and more common in, in single cell gene expression data, but still there are a lot of studies that do not make use of them. Um, I'm not going to mention a lot of QC. There wasn't a lot of discussion of QC in, in this meeting in general, but um, one important aspect of single cell data, um, it's always important in genomics and high dimensional data, of course, but in single cell data in particular is developing QC metrics. And the reason I am mentioning them um, 
briefly is because we have found, and I'm sure that other people would agree, that those QC metrics have to develop for each data set independently. It's, 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 we're not yet in the uh, point of technology development where we have complete standard technology and complete standard protocol such that the uh, QC can be standardized and that the metrics are uh, can be applicable across different studies and, and data set. If, if, if uh, some of you are familiar with the, with the ENCODE uh, kind of history project, we, we're in the early days of ENCODE where, where the first four years were just about developing the understanding of what would constitute high quality data. And so we spent quite a lot of time developing QC metrics for this data, and, and I'm showing a table like this not because the numbers would mean anything or that I want to point out specific numbers, but because those numbers are only specific for this data set, and when we obtain different data set, we had to repeat this, this exercise. Before I'm talking about batch effects, I'd like to talk about the importance of those unique molecular identifiers, the UMIs. Um, I still feel that uh, my, my impression is that there's still a, a sizable uh, proportion of groups that, uh, for one reason or another, decide not to use unique molecular identifiers when they collect a uh, data set. And most of the time when people justify this decision, they point to the ERCC, those spiking controls, and they show that the mean molecule, which is when you count molecules based on these UMIs, count, and the mean read count, which is when you pretend that you didn't have those UMIs, those correlate pretty neatly. And those are those blue dots in my, in my plot here. And you can indeed see that UMIs are not very effective, uh, or rather they're not needed to correct for particular biases in the ERCC, those spiking counts. Uh, and, and that is true. But it is not true when you look at the endogenous counts of genes that are actually expressed in those uh, lines. Uh, there you see that the variance, the bias due to amplification of different genes uh, is considerable, and without the uh, unique molecular identifiers, without actually counting molecules, you will introduce a substantial amount of variation, uh, and the variation uh, is m also going to be correlated with the actual gene expression level, which will completely compound the problem. And again, in the context of trying to understand variation between individuals will make it quite a bit more challenging. So this is a call to certainly use UMIs in, in these studies. When you use UMIs, the task of recapturing the average gene expression level for the culture from the bulk sequencing using single cell data becomes trivial, both for genes that are highly expressed as well as for genes that are expressed at low levels. It really is trivial. The moment you hit 40, 50, 60 single cells, that's it, you already captured the mean. Uh, but of course, it's not the mean that we're interested in. I mean, if we, we are interested in this entire meeting was about it, about the variance and the outliers and the correlations and, and the, the high resolution data. And for that, we need to start looking at the differences between cells and the interaction between that, those variation and the variation in genotype. And the standard way of doing that, again, when uh, people are typically using the standard study design where individual and batch are completely confounded, is to rely on these ERCC controls, whether they're measured with or without UMIs, to adjust for the batch effect, for the difference between the technical batches. Uh, the rationale is that the ERCC are outside the samples. They're not part of the individual. The batch effect would affect the ERCC counts in a way that is uncorrelated to the genotype. And so by adjusting to those, uh, you will adjust for the batch effect. And the psychology or the philosophy is very similar to the uh, uh, approaches that we just heard about in this session, but a much simpler approach is simply an adjustment based on the expression. And what I'm showing you here um, is the uh, uh, total ERCC molecule count on the y-axis, and then on the x-axis, differentiated by colors and shades, are the data from different individuals, colors, and different uh, batches, shades. And you can see that in the red, I only have two for technical reasons we removed, uh, well, decided that the one, one replica did not pass QC. And what's really interesting here, and it's not so subtle, but it's, I think, I feel, is underappreciated, is that the ERCC counts are not only affected by the batch. In fact, the largest difference between ERCC counts that you see here on the slide is associated with the individual. 
not with the technical batch. And that is actually something that we never appreciated in microarrays. We never appreciated when we added ERCCs to bulk sequencing in the early days of RNA sequencing. The fact that there is an endogenous effect, interaction, if you will, between the ERCC output and the sample they are added to. And that, of course, means that uh, normalization, standardization, correction based on ERCC counts alone will actually impact the uh, observed variation between the individuals. Um, in fact, individual may have a stronger impact on the ERCC count than batch. I am not going to stand here and uh, uh, claim that this is going to be general for every data set, but in our data set, uh, this is uh, what we see from the, from the picture when we correlate total gene molecule count on the X and total ERCC count on the Y. And I don't think that this is an unusual picture based on the other data sets I've seen. So, what causes this? What is the mechanism for this type of batch effect that com is completely correlated with genotype by design, but also seem to interact with the endogenous sample uh, uh, when you construct it this way? I'm not entirely certain, but one of the, uh, uh, this is actually not an easy uh, uh, question to answer uh, uh, from an engineering perspective or from a molecular biology perspective, but we have opportunistically noted that the conversion efficiency from reads to molecules, when you count the reads and then you convert them to molecules based on the UMI uh, indexes, uh, this actually, that property actually also has an individual association. And so uh, the capturing efficiency that would determine the uh, the conversion efficiency on the same, if you, if you sequence each uh, library to the same depth, actually seems to be an individual specific property, not just single cell property. We usually think of capturing as uh, mostly associated with the technology. C1 will capture more than the drop uh, 10x will be somewhere in between. If not with the technology, then associated with the batch. This batch worked better. I have a better capturing efficiency. This batch worked worse. I don't have as much capturing efficiency. We don't typically think about it also as, or, you know, to most we think about it as a sample property, but not really as an individual property. And I think that this is also maybe an individual property which would explain some of the uh, impact of batch effect that we have seen that segregate by the individual. How much variation, let's put it in context, how much variation is due to a uh, batch? Certainly much, much less than the variation we see due to uh, expression across different individual cells, in fact, an order of magnitude less variation, but importantly, on the same magnitude as the variation we see between individuals. And so if you look at the overall variance in gene expression between single cells across different individuals, which is arguably, from a clinical perspective, what we ultimately will have to work with to understand threshold effects and when disease happens and the impact of outliers and maybe the genetic impact on, on this type of variation and noise in gene regulation, that is on the same order of magnitude as the batch effect. And so to reiterate and to say quite simply, if batch effect is completely confounded with your individual genotype, it's hopeless. You will not be able to recover it for a clinical uh, application. Let's sh let me show this to you. Uh, by plotting the data. So here are two standard ways of accounting for batch effect, either by, n uh, the, on the left, no correction. So it's simply a linear model that takes into account uh, uh, normalization without looking at ERCC or spiking. So no, no real attempt to correct for the batch effect. And the different colors here represent the different individuals. There's actually different shapes for the different batches, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I know you cannot see it, and, and the point that I want to make is how different the picture will be for the variation between the individuals when we correctly account for the batch. On the right side, we are adjusting for the ERCC, so that's more standard. Most people don't just forget about batch. Most people assume that correcting for the ERCC spiking would correct for most of the batch effect, and so this, this picture, of course, looks quite different. You can start seeing the separation between the individual better, but it's quite different than what happens when you actually correctly account for the batch effect independently from the genotype by construction, and that's the picture I'm highlighting now. Uh, is the larger picture on the right. And so you can see, because it's the same order of magnitude variation between individuals than between batches, uh, 
while most of the variation is, of course, between the single cells, the uh, 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 inability to correct a batch effect will make it quite a bit more challenging to use that data. So, fortunately, the solution for the uh, uh, vast majority of applications that consider differences between individuals is actually quite trivial and unlike in most other genomic technologies, would not require much more effort or funding. You simply have to multiplex multiple individuals into the same type of single cell batch, recover the identity of each cell by the genotype. If you do RNA sequencing or taxic or, of course, genomic sequencing, this will be immediately available, and then assign the individual identity to each cell. When you will do that multiple times to, to ultimately get the same number of cells you wanted originally, you will be able to completely independently dissociate the batch effect from the individual. So, so it's actually a, we, we, were, we were in a great position. Usually my lab publishes papers about batch effects ruining studies and the conclusion is there's nothing you can do about it other than to put a lot of money and effort and a lot of graduate students. In this case, we were rewarded by saying, you know what, it's trivial. Just, just stop for a moment and, and think about the design differently, but it will require the same amount of funding and more or less the same type of, of effort. So armed with this knowledge, we, we, we wanted to tackle another challenge. Uh, and this is the challenge of, I would say, definitions or, or our standard uh, approach into thinking about different terms in biology and how these might evolve uh, now that we have high resolution uh, single cell data. And, and, and we heard a lot during the day about cell type and cell phase. And, in the discussion, I really enjoyed questions and, and answers about uh, what does it mean, and, and, and in particular, um, when, when, when cells become um, not entirely distinct from each other, and there's a continuum, and maybe uh, as a statistician, we will think about it as membership grade of cells, two different cell types. I actually think that cell type is an extremely difficult problem, uh, which requires a lot of work, so I'm not going to talk about it anymore. But cell phase, I think, cell phase can demonstrate the power of this high resolution data and why the concept needs to involve. And I think that will imply for cell type as well. Because what we've been doing with cell cycle phase for decades is uh, depicted exactly here. I'm, I'm showing you, as you, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, immediately identify just, just an example of a fax analysis for cell cycle where we draw these gates and, and then call them G1 and S and, and, and G2. And those gates are based on the expression of different markers, and certainly uh, a lot of they're enriching for cells that are at that phase. But really, we know that this is a cell cycle and that um, there are no sharp transitions between these uh, different phases, that this is a definition that we impose because of the resolution that was afforded to us, but ultimately we can perhaps evolve or try to think about a methodology that ignores the sharp transitions and consider each cell uh, position somewhere along this cycle. And it is possible that uh, gene expression in single cell data allows us to think about this resolution. And so we um, wanted to play with this and think about uh, this type of approach in order to ultimately correct for cell cycle phase. Because let me tell you, we don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of time to put it all together in, in kind of one model, but uh, as important as batch effect to understand differences between individuals, cell cycle phase and differences in the cell cycle phase account for even a higher proportion of variants. And so far we've been correcting for them by really grouping all cells as G1 or M, and we have not been doing a very good job. And so we took um, advantage of a system that allows us to uh, read out the, uh, uh, get the information, independent information about the cell cycle phase by looking at fluorescence of a couple of genes that uh, are known to be great cyclical genes during the cell cycle phase. And we use the study design that allows us to collect the same data for the fluorescence and the RNA from each individual cell. So we visualize the fluorescence and then we take the cell from the same well. So we have the as gold standard as this would be considered in this, in this uh, field for a readout on the cell cycle phase and RNA sequencing from the same cell. And we've done that for multiple individuals. And the idea, of course, was to use a, based on our previous lesson, uh, uh, a study design that will 
uh, allow us to account for the batch effects independently from the individual. And this is just a graphic description of that study design where you can see that on every C1 plate we have more than one individual and then we re replicate the individuals on multiple plates with different individual partners. So that's a, an, an, you know, with the linear models you can trivially account for that batch effect very effectively. And then we looked at the actual Fucci labels to ascertain the cell cycle phase of each cell type, and we consider it on a continuum of a circle, a cycle. And so this is actually the, uh, this is actually the, uh, the number of cells that we ultimately classify to each place on the cell cycle phase based on the intensities of the uh, red and the green in our uh, fluorescence data. And so, what we wanted to do is ultimately figure out whether we can predict cell cycle phase based on the RNA sequencing data. So cell cycle phase measured by fluorescence, RNA sequencing data will include some genes that have cyclic expression pattern, and can we actually put the two together to uh, build a classifier? And you know, from now, from this point on, the, the building of the classifier and applying it is very similar to all the standard approaches we've been hearing about and, and, and reading about. We have not done anything unusual here, except consider it as a cycle and a continuous cycle at that, rather than classifying to a particular discrete state that would be associated with a lot of variation around it. And so, we identify cyclic genes that correspond to the uh, cell cycle phase measured by the fluorescence, and the only assumption we're really making here uh, other than building a, a standard classifier, is expressed uh, here, which is that uh, we assume that the uh, prior probability of a cell to be anywhere on that cell cycle phase is uniform. Now, I'm not going to defend that assumption too strongly because I think it's wrong. I can tell you by simulation that it can only make a classifier worse. So on average, it always makes the classifier as good as it can be or worse, but I think Looking into that assumption a little better can make the classifier, uh, can improve the performance of the classifier. So how well can we do using uh, gene expression? Um, um, we're going to measure this using the following approach. So we'll, uh, we're going to uh, train the classifier on uh, five individuals and always test it on the six individuals. So it's not a random 20% of the data, it's, it's just another individual, which just I felt is, is more robust because you basically ask how well the classifier will perform on an individual not seen in the training at all. And then we'll measure the error by how far on the cycle we uh, predict the cell to be given the truth, which is the fluorescence data. So in this example, if this is the truth, anywhere we predict here would be a 25% error. And so we're uh, going to try this with a small number of genes and then increase the number of genes to see if we can do better when we add more genes. And the first lesson I'll tell you, the first take home message is that uh, we cannot do much better than simply relying on five genes, which we found to be extremely surprising uh, given other classifiers of, of, uh, of uh, uh, the discrete phase. And I think this is partially because we are considering very high resolution uh, data and partially because you really need the, the cyclical uh, trend to be able to do this when you consider the continuous distribution. And uh, so you can see here that we're doing pretty well for most most in when, when most of the individuals are uh, left out and being predicted. There's one individual where we do slightly worse, but still within an uh, 0.2 which is significantly better than chance. Most of them are between 0.1 to 0.15 error. Uh, this is 15% error to what expected. Um, and, um, you know, when we develop a new method to classify something, you almost get the question, how does, well does it compare to other methods? Well, even in the world where you always pick the application to favor your own method. This is, this is an outlier because there's no other method that works on anything but discrete states. And so I'm immediately going to favor my application. This is by design, by definition. So there's no surprise here. Nevertheless, uh, we have to show it. Uh, reviewers demand it. Uh, this is accepted. So, so we, we chose one uh, methodologies that, uh, that uh, classify genes, classify cells to different cell cycle phase based on uh, discrete, based on gene expression to discrete states, uh, and of course we're doing better, and again this is not really fair, but it does 
uh, underscore, I think, the fact that this is a different uh, paradigm to look at single cell phase, and, and, and I think that one that we intuitively wish to evolve because we have the high resolution data to do this. So uh, you can do, you can, I'm sorry, you can uh, do much better uh, using our approach than, than an approach that was clearly optimized for the wrong application in this case. Uh, and you can see it here as well when you look at discrete based or PICO is our uh, weird acronym for our methodology. Um, and, and when you look at the actual genes that underlie those predictions, of course they have a much more cyclical uh, pattern in, in, in our prediction than in the prediction of the discrete methodology. And again, uh, do not to belabor this point, this was not a fair comparison. Okay, so let me finish just by saying uh, we can correct, I think, for cell cycle phase in a way that is unusual given the standard in the field, and I, and I believe a little more effective. We clearly know how to do, uh, how to pursue a, a, a study design that uh, can correct for batch more effectively, as effectively as, as, as one can do, independently from the genotype. So can we look at the genetic impact on variation of gene expression between single cells. If we can do that, it's, I think, the first step towards personalized medicine using single cell genomics. And so we pursued this study where we looked at 53 individuals, looked at um, using a mixed individual plate design that I you know, spoke about at length, uh, looked at single cell gene expression data, and our idea was to try to map genotypes that are associated with variation in gene expression between cell types. We call them variance QTLs as opposed to expression QTLs. And I thought that I'm convinced that they exist, and I thought that I think, I still think that these are going to be very important to identify because they may underlie those threshold effects that are so important in penetrance and, and pharmacogenomics and so on. We did a lot of QC in the data that I will not tell you about because we don't have the time, uh, but I, I, you know, I, I, I have this perverse pleasure of showing a single slide that represents six months of work. Uh, and so here it is, I'm not even going to talk about it, but unfortunately, <laughs> we failed. Unfortunately, we failed. While we're doing very well at recapturing EQTL from single cell data that you can also see in bulk expression, and that's not surprising. Remember, I told you it's enough to have 30, 40 cells to already recapture the mean. All the variance QTLs we discovered, all the variance QTLs we discovered can be explained by the mean effect. Now, we've seen some other papers talking about variance QTLs. We haven't analyzed their data, but I believe because they haven't commented on this, that it's probable that those variance QTLs are also explained by mean effect. And the, imp the explanation here is that we have not been able to identify dispersion QTLs, right? QTLs that affect the dispersion, not affect the mean and therefore affect the variance. What would it take to do this? Well, in fact, we think that the uh, variance is larger than the difference in variance between individuals is actually larger than the difference in mean. We see that over and over again, many data sets, not just ours, but it is possible that the genetic effect on the variance as proportion of the variance is smaller for the variance between cells than for the mean difference between individuals. And so uh, you have to perform some power analysis and uh, figure out for different effect size, assuming that the variance we measure is the same, uh, is it possible to identify uh, these? Can we design a study with, with numbers that make sense to ultimately uh, identify those associations if they exist? And the answer is, um, yeah, it's not going to be uh, extremely prohibitive. When, when we get close to 400, 500 individuals, we'll be able to identify them. This number here is with extremely conservative assumptions. So, so even if, if the effects are extremely small and the variance that we identified is an underestimate of the technical variance, uh, still under 2,000 individuals we identified. I mean, that sounds high, but you know, think about the type of studies that we do these days with gene expression, uh, where 10,000 and 20,000 individuals, I'm sure that this is you know, just around the corner in genomic time scales. Um, and I think that it's very possible that the system we use, the IPSC system that we use for this study, actually has a lower, smaller effect size uh, for variance than in other terminal cell types because of canalization. And so, uh, but this is how I kind of rationalize my own work as we proceed and pursue this. It might not actually be true. Okay, so I'm going to uh, stop here by just saying uh, 
the three messages for my work is consideration for effective style design, I think, are extremely important, and we have not seen them yet pervasive in the field. Uh, the, the standard concepts potentially should involve. Uh, my wife always says that I always sound sure of myself even when I shouldn't. So I, I, I don't know if they have to evolve, but I think we need to think about it. I think, I think it, it doesn't always make sense anymore to use discrete classification of cell phase or cell type. I think membership grade and, con and distribution should, 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 at least we should at least think about them and see if they are advantageous uh, for our purposes. And I think more research into source of variation surely will be needed here, especially when uh, the goal is to look at personalized medicine using these technologies and threshold effects. Um, everything was done by my lab, and I want to remember two names, people who are in the job market now, postdoc Abhishek, Sarkar, and Joyce, uh, who really are responsible for all of this work. And I thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. So I have a sort of intellectual question about single cell platforms. So in your droplet-based platforms, certain, I guess, uh, things seem to accumulate noise and you get noise and increase signal in discrete small number of, I guess, data points. Whereas in a indexing-based platform, you have a consistent level of noise that is present across the data that lifts the whole signal. So what you were talking about in, the, in your first part of your talk, do you see that changing depending on the type of single cell platform that you're using, whether you're accumulating noise or you're lifting the whole signal? Um, yeah, I actually think that, respectfully, I reject that uh, notion even with the UMIs. I, you don't have the amplification bias that changes that. That, that creates this difference between genes as you describe, but you still have an interaction between the endogenous sample and the UMI in ways that are complicated and I'm not sure I understand them, and I wouldn't be comfortable making the assumption that it's just a scaling factor. But that said, it is certainly different across technologies. Uh, we have seen this uh, behavior um, changes quite dramatically between the, the drop sick, the, the droplet-based technologies, to other microfluidics, to the 10X and, and, and C1. And, and part of the differences are that the, the, just the, the, the capturing efficiency, which determines how deeply you sample, will also impact, because it impacts the complexity of the library, will also impact the, uh, the estimates of variation. It might not be true if we always uh, sequence to saturation, but since we never do at this point, it's certainly an impact. Just before, just one question. Come to the mic. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Rad Vardigepali from Jefferson in Philadelphia. Uh, very nice talk. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And, and, uh, one comment is I, I totally support the idea of thinking of cell molecular state as a continuous variable. And, uh, but the, the discrete discretization may be a useful abstraction in some cases, and we should, we should not throw it away at the same time. We should evaluate when it is useful and use it appropriately, the levels of discretization, or do we need a real continuous representation? Um, the question is, um, do you uh, image these cells in the cell cycle study uh, up until you sample, or uh, do you only get the uh, image right around when you sample them with the Fuji you image? Them, you, you sample them within an hour, I believe, of imaging. Okay. The reason why I ask that is I wonder if you actually image them throughout, uh, then you might actually be able to not just figure out the cell cycle phase, but can figure out the duration of cell cycle. And trying to understand whether uh, the molecular programs are aligned with the duration of a cell cycle could itself could be very interesting. Uh, I agree. I agree. We don't have the. I need to think whether that's possible, but we don't. We have not done this. Okay, because the, there is. A, we have done a similar study where we are looking at differentiation of bacteria positive cells in embryoid bodies, and if you continuously image them for about two and a half days or so, every so often, five ten minutes or so. And so you'll see that each EB, each embryoid body, shows a very characteristic, its own unique um, emergence of vacuary positive cells. 
but they all follow a certain characteristic curve, if you will, that can be described by a specific you know, slope rate, some kind of a you know, simpler functional parameters. And the molecular programs, when we sample them, because it's a snapshot molecular program, can be mapped to those parameters of the function as opposed to the stage they are in. So you, again, the snapshot becomes informative of a temporal history uh, and the underlying functionals that generate the thing, um, the outcome. If, if you had a continuous data up until your sample. I think that's fascinating. Do you have a, is, the, is this published? It's in scientific or reports, or? Uh, 2016. Okay. I don't know this. Thank you. Uh, I just have a, uh, I, I really, uh, I agree with you in terms of doing more studies uh, on social issues. Uh, to see what is what is the leading reasons for the variations that you see, you see that the, uh, the, you showed that the slide where UMI sounds somehow it's interacting with the individual. But I was wondering if it's because the operator somehow, you know, with this person's doing the experiment, there's slight variation in his hand. So a couple of days ago, I saw that the TNX just released some robotics to prepare the library automatically without using human hands, assuming, um, I assume, I did not read the detail. So I wonder if that will help with the UMI efficiency being differently incorporated in each individual sample. Yeah, um, so when we did this study, I couldn't answer it, but today, because we're using the incomplete block design where we mix individuals before we do anything with them, I can tell you that it still persists. So it's, it doesn't seem to be, a property of the sample handling because those steps are shared across individuals that are mixed into the same batch. So is there some sort of internal property from the sample, the biology? That is the implication, yes. So actually, that's, that, that was my question because one is you talk sort of revived my post-traumatic stress disorder from like 2000. But we spend a lot of time trying to understand the source of batch effects and then said, oh, we don't care about it. We're going to do blog designs and we're going to be okay. Um, and I said, I had a series of talks that I used Mike Lysen's cluster to show that we could cluster based on the technician that extracted the RNA, the date that the samples were run. All of us were having I think I used some of your slides. But here's the thing. So the question is, are there inherent issues with the technologies that create and magnify these batch effects, or are we just seeing the same issues as before? Uh, I think I can answer that to some degree. There is certainly a difference between the technologies and the extent to which we see an individual association with UMI conversion. And so to some extent, it's certainly technology-based, not the protocol. Not, not just Nextera, but actually how you isolate the cells and capture them. Uh, I don't know what the reasons are, but I think we can at least answer that to some extent it's technology driven. So I'm actually glad we have uh, one online uh, question. Um, if, you're, uh, if we need to correct for cell cycle, is it uh, also recommended we correct for circadian regulation? Uh, that's an excellent question, and uh, Raul just asked me that before he left. Um, it, intuitively, I would say probably yes. We have, I don't have any data um, about this, but I, I, I would not bet against it, yes. Thank you again.